Hey everybody, welcome back to another part. Uh, my name is Prescott, I'm here at Psych Sync, so Sync Psychology, and today we are going to be starting Chapter 13, Industrial Organizational Psychology from the OpenStax Online Psychology 2e textbook. Uh, I'm actually really excited for this chapter because this is actually a um, field of psychology that I'm particularly interested in, so this should be fun for me, or interesting for me as well. So, let's get started. What is Industrial Organizational Psychology? It is a branch of psychology that studies how human behavior and psychology affect, affect work and how they are affected by work. Uh, industrial organizational psychologists work in academia, government, consulting firms, and business. So here you can see some people on their laptops getting work done. So yeah. So areas of industrial organizational psychology. There's industrial psychology, which is it studies job characteristics applicant characteristics and how to match them. Also, studies employ training and performance appraisal. Uh, this, this industrial psychology focuses on hiring and maintaining employees and considers issues of legality regarding discrimination and hiring. Next, we have organizational psychology. Uh, this studies interactions between people working in organizations and effects of those interactions on productivity. They're interested in worker satisfaction, motivation, commitment, management, and leadership styles, social norms, and role expectations. Uh, and it considers harassment and workplace violence. So here we have, you know, some people discussing in an office. You have a typical, you know, desk job workplace right there. So human factor psychology. It studies how workers interact with the tools of work and how to design those tools to optimize workers' productivity, safety, and health. It is known as ergonomics in Europe. And tools of work, excuse me, um, tools of work can include interaction with the machine, workstation, environment displays, and the local environment, for example, lighting. So here you can see a nice picture showing somebody working at their computer, uh, like what's most comfortable for them, lumbar support for the lower back, the seat angle, like so even an office job where you're at a computer, um, they're involved, human factors is involved in that, how to make it safest, most comfortable, and optimized. Okay, so historical development. So in the early 20th century, 20th century James Cattle, Hugo Munsterberg, and Walter Dill Scott, uh, they were all students of Wilhelm Wundt, if you remember him from earlier units, and conducted research focusing on what is now called industrial psychology. So what we went over a little bit ago. Uh, Cattle, or Cattell, I don't know how you say it, founded the Psychological Corporation, which is a psychological consulting company, Munsterberg published Psychology and Industrial Efficiency in 1913, which covered employee selection, employee training, and effective advertising. And Scott was one of the first psychologists to apply psychology to advertising, management, and personal selection. Uh, and he published the first books to describe the use of psychology in the business world. Now, in World War I, Robert Yerkes organized a group that developed methods for screening and selecting enlisted men. And he also developed the Army Alpha Test to measure mental abilities. Then Scott, then Scott and Walter Bingham organized a group with the goal to develop selection methods for officers. So, continuing on, oh, on Elton Mayo conducted studies at Western Electric's Hawthorne work in, from 1929 to 1932. Uh, he explored interpersonal relations, motivation, and organizational dynamics, examined how human interaction factors enhanced or decreased productivity, he was the origin of organizational psychology, and researchers reported that any changes they made to variables resulted in increased productivity. Going on, so the Hawthorne effect, and if you haven't heard of it, now you're gonna find out what it is. Um, years after Mayo's study, researchers analyzed the results and noticed that employees performed better when researchers or supervisors observed and interacted with them. It suggested that productivity increased because people's performance changes when they are being observed, you know, the observer effect. So. The Hawthorne effect is the increase in performance of individuals who are noticed, watched, and paid attention to by researchers or supervisors. So it's similar to the um, observer effect where it, you know, when, they, when somebody knows they're being watched, their behavior or their performance in, at work tends to change. So Kurt Lewin in the 1930s researched, effect, researched effects of leadership styles, team structure, and team dynamics and he studied group interactions, cooperation, competition, and communication, and coined the term group dynamics. Now, Frederick Taylor, 1911, strived to engineer workplaces to increase productivity. 
Uh, the Principles of Scientific Management examines management styles, personal selection, and training. So here you have, um, well, it doesn't tell you which one it is, Kurt Lewin or Frederick Taylor, but one of the two, there you have a copy of Principles of Scientific Management, and here it looks like a steel mill or something like that. So, um, yeah, anyways. All right, so continuing on, uh, Lillian Gilberth is the mother of modern management. Uh, she strove to find ways to increase productivity, studied efficiency improvements that reduced the number of motions required to perform a task and were applicable in the workplace, home, and other areas. And credited with the idea of putting shelves on the inside of refrigerator doors and foot pedal operated garbage cans. I had no idea about that. That's very interesting. Uh, she investigated employee fatigue and time management stress and found that many employees were motivated by money and job satisfaction. So here we have a picture of her talking about the uh, cabinets in the refrigerator and then one of those foot pedal garbage cans. So selecting employees, job advertising. So job analysis is accurately describing the task or job. Task-oriented lists and detail the task that will be performed for the job, and worker-oriented describes characteristics required of the worker to successfully perform the job. For example, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Now, ONET is a database of previously complied or compiled job analysis for different jobs and occupations. So, candidate analysis and testing can involve testing, interviews, and work samples or exercises. So personality tests can be used to identify personality characteristics of the candidate and match those personality characteristics that would ensure good performance on the job. Other tests can include IQ test, integrity test, and physical tests such as drug tests or physical fitness tests. You have a physical job. Now, interviews can be influenced by social factors and body language, such as the degree of similarity of the applicant to the interviewer in nonverbal behaviors, for example, hand gestures and nodding and smiling. Research found that lack of eye contact and smiling lead to lower applicant ratings. Now, an unstructured interview, they ask different questions for different candidates, and questions are usually unspecified beforehand. Now, a structured interview is the same questions for every candidate. Questions are prepared in advance, and it is a standardized rating system for each response and more effective at predicting subsequent job performance of the job candidate. Next, we have training. So orientation. Training usually begins with an orientation period during which a new employee learns about company policies, practices, and culture. It educates the new employee about the organizational culture, the values, visions, hierarchies, norms, and ways the company's employees interact. Sorry, checking the time there. Uh, mentoring. Uh, experienced employee guides the work of a new employee. So yeah, an experienced employee guides the work of an employee. Uh, mentors may be formally assigned or developed informally. Now, research on mentoring. Mentoring positively affected protégés' compensation and number of promotions compared with non-mentored employees. Protégés were more satisfied with their careers and had greater job satisfaction. So, evaluating employees. Industrial organizational psychologists are often involved in designing performance appraisal systems for organizations. They aim to make valuations as fair as and positive as possible and decrease subjectivity. Performance appraisals are an evaluation of an employee's success or lack of success at performing the duties of the job. Uh, often used to motivate employees to improve performance and expand areas of competence. Now, a 350 degree feedback appraisal is when supervised customers, direct reports, peers, and the employee himself rate an employee's performance. And it provides different perspectives of employees' job performance, and often, but they often fail to accomplish their purpose because they are used incorrectly. So here you have, it's a 350 degree, because I guess this counts as an extra uh, 10 degrees or whatever. No, 360 would be all the way around, whoops. Uh, anyways, so supervisors, customers, self, peers, reports, they all flow in together. So... Bias and protection in hiring. Selecting candidates based on group membership when it does not directly affect potential job performance is discriminatory. Many laws exist to prevent hiring based on various group membership criteria. Pregnancy, religion, and age are some of the criteria on which hiring decisions cannot legally be made. So, you know, for example, did you know it is illegal for a potential employer to ask your age in an interview? So next time you're at a job interview, if they ask you for your age, that's illegal. You can get on to them for that. So here we have, you know, you're pregnant. They can't 
say, not hire you because of that or because of a certain religion or how old you are. That would be discrimination. So the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity, or the EEOC, is responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate against a job or applicant or an employee because of the person's race, color, religion, or sex, including pregnancy, uh, national origin, age, so 40 or older, disability, or genetic information. So here we have selected text from legislation prohibiting employment discrimination. So here we have the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I'm not going to go super into it, but if you guys feel like it here, you know, pause the video, you can read it, but it's saying real quick how it should be an unlawful employment practice for an employer to fail or hire any individual based because of such individual's race, color, religion, sex, so civil rights, the Age of Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967, and Titles 1 and 5 of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1988. So here are some examples that prohibit employment discrimination. So, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity, oh yeah, continued anyways, um, is the Equal Pay Act requires equal pay for men and women in the same workplace who are performing equal work. The Title VII, which we saw back there, the Civil Rights Act 1964 makes it illegal to treat individuals unfavorably, unfavorably because of their race or color of their skin. Uh, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1978 prohibits job discrimination of a woman because she is pregnant as long as she can perform the work required. Then there's Americans with Disabilities Act, where employers cannot discriminate against any individual based on a disability. Now, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities, such as hearing, walking, and breathing. It has been expanded to include individuals with alcoholism, former drug use, obesity, or psychiatric disabilities. And finally, there's the Bonafide Occupational Qualification, or the BFOQ. And it is a requirement of certain occupations for which denying an individual employment would otherwise violate the law, such as requirements concerning religion or sex. So in some cases, religion, national origin, age, and sex are bona fide occupational qualifications. So I think that's where we'll stop this first video before we get into job satisfaction and whatnot. But I hope you guys enjoyed, found it interesting. I know I certainly did. And I hope you guys swing by in the next video where we will leave up we'll start where we leave off here in job satisfaction um again i hope you guys enjoyed the video my name is prescott i'm here at psych sinks the sink psychology and i will hopefully see you in the next video thanks bye